Hi, my name is James and welcome to Kingspine Woodworking. Today we're going to wrap up our series of shed building videos. This is the fifth and final installment. Hopefully this series was able to help you on your journey to build your own shed, whatever size it might be. This particular one might be a little deceptive. It's actually really big. It's a 10 by 16 with 9 foot sidewalls, 12 feet of clearance on the inside, and it's got a 7 foot door. Uh, but these principles apply to any shed you want to build. All sizes build exactly the same way. The purpose of this shed building series is to give you an exact step-by-step -step tutorial so that you can build any size shed that you want. I'll be following the International Building Code Guidelines IBC rules for building this shed and just about every jurisdiction in the United States complies with these codes. My purpose is to make this tutorial easy enough to follow even for someone who has no building experience and the project is designed so that it can be done with a minimum number of tools. All you really need is a circular saw, a drill, a hammer, and some basic hand tools and you can accomplish this project. First, I just wanted to take a few seconds to talk about our Christmas sale. We've been building these Thor's hammer woodworking mallets for a while and typically every Christmas we put them on sale for half price. This is the first year, however, that we're making ones with a laminated head with multiple different species of exotics. And while this is our first time to offer this type of a mallet head, this is actually our last year to offer the half price sale. One reason is because it really takes up a lot of time to build a large batch of mallets over the holiday season. And another is that we are actually going to probably be out of several species, such as the Lignum Vitae and the Cocobolo. These are two species that are on the IUCN Red List and the Cites Appendix 2. They're very endangered or threatened in their region and they're just no longer being imported into the US. So when we're out, we're out. If this is something you're interested in, there's a link in the description below to the website where they're on sale and the code to get them for half price. Thank you very much and let's get back to finishing our shed. The first thing we're going to tackle today is the roof and a good friend of mine, Adam from GBS Roofing has come over to help us out. Fortunately, he also offered to help us get the decking down, so that made it go really quick for us. Now I've done roofing in the past for several decks that we've built, uh, including patio covers and for some other sheds. And of course I did the roofing for our workshop there, but it's far from perfect. There's a lot of little errors and there's a whole lot that I could learn about it. So I thought it'd be fantastic to have a professional on board today. One of the key things to remember is that the decking has to be staggered. That's one of the things that gives the roof a lot of structural integrity. And one other thing that we did differently from code here is that we actually beefed up the thickness of the OSB sheeting that is used. Uh, code actually in our area requires a 7 16 inch OSB sheeting and we upgraded it to uh, 5 eighths of an inch. Now it's a thicker sheathing and it does cost a little bit more money, but to me it's worth the cost. We're talking seven or eight sheets of this OSB material here, and I think it's about three to four dollars a sheet more. So, you know, really what's 20 or 25 bucks when you've got 1500 or two grand into a shed. I was able to stay on the ground today and cut all the material that they needed and pass it up, and Adam stayed up top, so it made today pretty efficient. And whenever you can, it does make things a whole lot easier if you can pre-cut the materials after you've measured them on the ground and then put them up already cut to size. Uh, you can certainly put them up, let them overhang, and trim them to fit, but it's a lot more efficient if you can do that cutting on the ground. A lot easier, a lot safer, I think. I also wanted to mention that we have a full set of 3D plans available. This can be handy if you don't have a ton of building experience since all the dimensions are labeled for you and all of the angles for the roof line, uh, the rafters, things like that have already been pre-calculated and you don't have anything to do but cut them to size and assemble it. And we also have sets of plans in each of the popular shed sizes and I'll put a link to those in the description below. It took us less than 20 minutes to get half of this shed decked out. It's really pretty fast if you can have somebody working down low and somebody up high. We've decided to install a ridge vent in this shed. I plan on storing a bunch of hardwood lumber in here and I don't want it to get so hot in there in the summer that the wood bakes and dries out. So uh, Adam is cutting the ridge vent at this point. 
The ridge vent is something that doesn't quite go all the way to the edge. There are manufacturer instructions on the package that the ridge vent comes in, so it's pretty easy to figure out just what to do. You gotta be pretty careful when walking on a steeply pitched roof that has a lot of sawdust on it that makes it very slippery and so you need to take every opportunity whenever you get any sawdust accumulated to blow or sweep that sawdust off. It's a, it's a pretty serious safety issue. Here Adam is removing this temporary support that we put in place to ensure that each of the rafters that we put up were vertical and spaced correctly apart from one another. Now that we have the roof decking in on the other side, we know that these rafters aren't going to move, so we no longer need this temporary support. You might notice that Adam's fairly close to those overhead lines. He is making sure not to touch them, but the two that are very low there, they're actually cable television and telephone. And we did check with our local public service company to verify that the power lines are actually seven or eight feet above those. The other half of the shed was actually decked off camera, but it's identical to the first. And Adam is just cutting out the second half of the ridge vent. And here Adam is putting on the drip edge for the eave. We basically run it a little bit long, cut it and bend it around the corner of the gable end, and then nail it down. And we got a little more detailed view on the other side to show you just what it looks like and how the cuts need to be made. Put a V cut in the top of the drip edge. This is the part that goes on top of the roof. And then the bottom part, which contains a little bit of a soffit piece to uh, guide the rain away from the edge. We'll just have to put a snip there. And that's going to allow this drip edge to fold over onto itself. And we just make sure that the side that goes up on the gable end goes over the top of the portion that goes down on the eave. Then we can make sure the corners are nice and snug before we begin nailing it down. Next, Adam is going to snap some chalk lines to help guide the exact location of the felt paper that's going to go down. And the first chalk line is going to go up that's the, uh, a distance of the exact width of the felt paper itself. Different parts of the country and different municipalities have differing rules on the type of underlayment that goes down. There's a 15 pound roofing felt and there's a 30 pound roofing felt and those might matter depending on where you're at and the type of roof that you have. But in addition to that, if you're going to heat uh, a shop or a garage or a shed and you live in an area where there's a serious ice or snow problem, then you might need an ice and water barrier for your very first course of this material. So you'll need to check with your local building department to see what is exactly is required. For us, it was really simple because we have no intention of heating our shed, and so we simply have to use 15 pound felt. Once felt paper is laid out flat, we use a plastic capped nail in order to secure this down. The whiter surface of the plastic cap helps hold this tar paper down uh, nice and securely in the event of a wind, so it's not as easy to get torn and rip up. Then the edge of the felt paper will be cut flush with the edge of the roof and size over there on the ladder doing that for us. And we'll just continue on with the next course of felt paper above that. And of course, as the courses go higher and higher, the, each one has to overlap the course that came below us. This is what aids in allowing the water to shed off the surface. Thank you. 
I'd like to take a minute to give a shout out to all of our viewers and fans on our Patreon page. Uh, they do a lot to help us support the channel, and I'd like to say thank you to everybody. If supporting the channel is something you might be interested in doing, you can visit us at our Patreon page. I have a link to that in the description below. With the felt paper fully down on this side, we're going to go ahead and install the gable end drip edge. And it's just a little bit different from the drip edge that we put on the eave. It's not quite as wide. And so Adam's going to line it up there and take a look at the angle. And he's going to trim this to roughly match the angle of, uh, of our overhang there. So it's relatively straight. And we'll put it in place over the top of the felt paper and nail it down. We'll let it run wild at the top for now and we'll come back and trim and fit that out when we finish the second half of the roof. With felt paper and drip edge complete, we're going to start with shingles. And we're going to begin with the starter course. The starter course comes in a package like this usually, and you can you break them in half. They're perforated down the middle. And this is what we're going to run around the perimeter of the building before we put our primary shingles on top. So these get passed up and the adhesive strip of course is down at the bottom of these and we let the first one overlap by about five inches because the first shingle is going to go directly on top of this and the first shingle is going to be a full shingle. But we can't have the seam of a shingle match with the seam of the starter course. So we've backed the starter course up by about five inches so that the first uh, shingle seam isn't splitting at the same spot as this. We're going to run one up the gable edge as well. This is going to allow the shingle to bond down securely to this, and that's going to help us out in higher wind situations. And Adam is measuring here to give us a very small overhang and keep it uniform from high to low. Next, he'll be cutting the excess off of the starter course there, making sure to keep the same amount of overhang as the starter course piece that goes up the gable edge. And now we get to start our first course of actual shingles. Uh, the first one's going to be a full shingle, and we'll just make sure it lines up flush at the bottom and flush with our overhang on the left. Code calls for six nails in each shingle. And when the second shingle goes up, it's also going to be backed up by five inches off the left. He'll do the same with the third shingle, backing it up five inches more still. And this is what establishes the pattern and the waterproofness of any given roof. At this point, he'll trim the extra ones off, and he's actually using a shingle there turned sideways as a straight edge. You can't quite see it in the video, but that way he keeps these uh, cuts nice and neat, and then those off cuts that he has taken off will be used most likely at the other end of the building. So Adam has extended down the building quite a ways in order to allow his staggered pattern to work all the way up to the top of the roof on this side and he's trimming off those final portions and now it's just a matter of filling in the remainder of the shingles all the way across the building. At this point, you can see the work goes pretty quick. With this side of the building complete, it's time to trim away the shingles that have blocked the opening for the ridge vent. 
And once that's complete, this side of the shed is fully done. Now back to the left side of the building, once the tar paper is worked up to the point where the top is, he's got to make sure that he runs that underneath the felt paper. And then he can secure that wild edge down. You see he made a slit in the top of it there in order to allow it to fold over on itself. And then he'll just continue that down with drip edge down below. The top piece can't be secured until the bottom piece is because remember everything on roof, the top part has to go over the bottom part. That's how we allow the water to shed off. With the drip edge complete, this side of the roof will be shingled exactly the same way as the first side. And when he gets to the top, it'll be time to trim away the extra shingle that were, that, shingles that were covering the opening for the ridge vent. Now we'll move on to the installation of the ridge vent itself. And you can see my skylight is getting covered. Kind of sad, but I guess that's okay. So there are typically instructions on the ridge vent package as to how you want to install this, uh, but it's not terribly complicated. Uh, it does require that you balance it perfectly around the top of the ridge of the roof. And when you put the nails in, you don't want to completely compress the nails because you'll flatten it out and it won't be able to breathe. It's important that air can move freely from through the ridge vent from on top of the shingles through the ridge vent and down into the building and vice versa. Once you have that ridge vent in place, then you can take some regular shingles. You'll need to divide these up. These also have a, a, a perforated edge, so they'll split nicely. And this is what we're going to use to cover the top of the ridge vent with. These also will need to get split evenly on both sides. And they'll just come to the edge of the ridge vent or possibly slightly overhang it a tiny bit. And you'll nail these down. Uh, the key here too is not to completely compress the nails down into the material. Again, we want air to get in through that ridge vent. Subsequent shingles are installed just the same way that they were installed on the roof. They're going to have the same amount of overlap and they're basically going to get one nail on either side and we're just going to complete or continue this uh, progression all the way to the other end of the shed. If you build your own shed or garage or building like that and you're in Colorado in the front range area and you decide everything was easy except for the roof and the roofing part, uh, you can give my friend Adam a call. I'm going to put his email down in the description below and he can come out and give you a bid and do a project like this for you. He's got a great company. They do fantastic work and this is really kind of the, one of the tougher parts of the build because it's up high. Definitely nothing wrong with having someone do that for you. And there's the roof when it's all complete. Now it's time to jump on a very easy part of the shed, and that would be the door. If your shed's not going to be insulated, a slab door is really all you need. And it's pretty simple to do. What I do is I cut a piece of siding, and I cut a piece of OSB. I did use 3 quarter inch OSB to get a little bit of thickness here for this part. And I cut it to the opening of the door. What I do is I cut it about a half inch shorter and a half inch narrower than the door opening. That way I get a quarter of an inch gap all the way around. Then I just use construction adhesive and screws to hold the whole thing together. It does take pretty small screws because they need to be short, so I did use quite a few of them. With the slab complete, I have filled all of the holes with latex caulking, and once that's dried, it's much easier to paint it now than it is when it's in place. Easier to do it now rather than have to worry about trimming around all the trim that goes around it. So it just takes a minute to break out the roller and cover this in paint at this point. And then with that done, I jumped on the trim. I just took full length pieces of trim here. I figured out how many it's going to take for me to wrap around that door, and I painted it. I put it on edge, painted one edge, laid it down flat, painted the flats, and just kind of worked around the surfaces that way. That made it real fast, and after that, I cut them to shape.
Once everything was dry, I went ahead and cut them and nailed them onto the door slab. You notice I've got to do a pretty good angle here with these nails since I'm going, since the shortest nail I have is longer than my whole thickness is here. Uh, alternatively, you could use some screws that were shorter. I found it quicker to do this because I'm just going to sand off those rough spots that have popped up and cover those with latex caulking anyway and just hit touch ups on those points. And then I also allowed the trim to extend out a little bit in a couple of different locations on the door because this is where I'm going to put the hinges. I need that extra little bit of thickness and strength and integrity to hold the hinges in place because the hinges are carrying the door and the door is fairly heavy and I want it to last a long time. While we were doing that, the girls were also painting the shed, the trim part of the shed at the same time. They had painted the body of the shed earlier in the day. I wanted to mention one more time that we do have a comprehensive set of plans for all of the popular shed build sizes and it's convenient because we have done all the math, all of the calculations for the roof rafters, the individual uh, trusses, everything's done for you. You don't have to do uh, any math on those, no figuring out. It's got a complete parts and materials list. All you need to do is cut the pieces according to the parts list and mostly assemble. So it can take a lot of effort and frustration out of a shed build for you. And uh, we've got a link to those in the description down below. We're about to trim out the door frame, so the first thing to do is put a piece of drip edge up over the top of the door that the door frame trim is going to go over, and that's going to prevent water from running down and running inside of the shed itself. After that's done, we'll also run a bead of latex caulking down the top to just try to further ensure some water tightness there. Next we'll put up our two side pieces of trim and it's important that this trim go up first before the door itself because we are actually going to, we want the trim on the door to be flush with the trim on the wall on the outside of the shed here and we're going to actually drive the screws from the hinges through both sets of trim. And once that's all set up we're going to bring the door and put it in place. We've got some quarter inch thick material down at the bottom there to act as a shim at the bottom because remember we want one quarter of an inch gap all the way around the perimeter of the door, the top, the bottom, and both sides. This is going to allow the door to swing freely and not get bound up in the future. So Kyle is inside of the shed and he's going to boot the door forward until we get it perfectly flush with the sides and then we're going to be able to install the hinges at that point. Once we make sure we have our gaps on the left and right equal at about a quarter of an inch, then we'll go ahead and set a hinge in place. We will pre-drill and we'll get them all screwed down. Now it's important to make sure that that hinge barrel is going perfectly vertical, straight up and down. That way the hinges aren't going to bind when the door opens and closes. If you had one hinge pointing up a little and one hinge pointing down a little, your door wouldn't open and swing very freely. There'd be some binding that occurs. It's also important that you use an adequate size screw for this. The hinges come with screws and it's usually a good idea to use those or to go up a size heavier. Uh, if you go with a weak screw, then of course your hinge isn't gonna last very long. It's gonna end up tearing out. So there's the last hinge to go on, so the next thing to do is to test the door and make sure it opens and closes freely. And it does. Not bad. Sai's pretty happy in there. She's staying out of the wind. The weather has turned bad on us here during this portion of the build. Then we're going to just need to do some touch-up on the paint for the things that we finished. And one final thing that I want to do is run some trim around the inside. So when the door closes, it's going to close against this trim. This trim here is going to act as one final weather or water barrier to try to keep the bad weather out. So I've basically taken a 2x4 and ripped it in half, or a couple of 2x4s, and I'm running this 2x2 two two essentially around the inside perimeter. And I have it, have it offset back probably about an eighth of an inch further back from where the door closes. And then I'm going to put on this window seal. This window seal is a foam rubber. It's a closed cell foam rubber, so it's watertight. 
and we're just going to run a border of this. It's got adhesive, adhesive on one side, and we're going to run a border of this all the way around the perimeter. So when the door closes, it'll close on this, squish it down just a little bit, you know, once the door latches, and that's going to give us our final little bit of weather barrier from the outside to the inside. I'd like to take a second to give a shout out to all of our friends at the King's Fine Woodworking community. It's an online closed Facebook group for woodworkers. It's a great place to share work or get help on work that you're doing. Um, and if you're a woodworker, it might be something that you're interested in joining. Uh, it's free, of course, and there is a link in the description down below if that sounds like something you would be interested in. All right, with that done, there is one final component of this build, and that's to put the last piece of trim on the bottom of the door. While it does attach to the door, we're gonna let it hang, a hang down about a half an inch below the surface, and it's gonna give us one final bit of waterproof barrier to prevent water from splashing from the ground up into the shed. And with that, the build's 100% complete. I'm glad you came on this journey with us, and thanks for watching.